Hi, everybody. Welcome to tonight's program. Thank you for joining us here on a special Monday night. And uh, me and Menachem felt like, you know, even though we only do Sunday night, we just had a big share last night that uh, so many things happening and to have Ramanas come and give us some clarity. It was important to uh, make uh, to make another share tonight back to back. I think this is the first time we ever did Sunday night and Monday night. So again, tonight's share is 162. First, I always start off thanking everybody for joining. And, uh, you know, the, as we know, we're doing this almost four years, Baruch Shem. This platform has been exploding. It's been a tremendous chizik for Klaus over the last four years. We've spoken about a lot of things. So please let people know about it. Every Sunday night, we do this program at uh, 930. And it's a place to have a sikhas chaver, a place to talk things out, get some clarity. And uh, so please let people know about it. And let's all join together. If anybody wants to join our WhatsApp statuses, just WhatsApp me at 848-525-0066. 848-525-0066. And every week I'll send you the flyers and the replays. You could also go to menachemberfel.com to his website, Coach Menachem's, and uh, you can uh, also get everything via email. So please join our Habura of learning and growing together. For all the people that are watching here on, on YouTube, please, please click on Coach Menachem's uh, subscribe button and you click on the like button. And uh, every Monday morning after the share, Menachem works the late night, midnight hours to upload the program. Somebody could watch it right away. We get usually uh, requests right after the share. They want to see it. They want to hear it, you know. And um, Baruch Hashem. Um, first, thank you to all the advertising sponsors, the Lakewood Scoop, Elian Ariel from Five Town Central, Kyla Kaufman from JCN. Again, if anybody's here for the first time, we do this usually on Sunday nights. And um, every Sunday night at 9.30, we have different cheer room, different topics, different therapists. Last night, we had a lawyer. So we really try to cover ground and bring the best of the best. And now that we're dealing with a uh, very, I would say, crucial time in, in the world and Klai Yisrael, Rav Manas is always here to really help us get clarity and some some adrocha. So, we, you know, Baruch Hashem, he was his mask and come on tonight. They worked the schedule. So please join. And uh, next week, we're going to have an amazing share with Rabbi David Sutton. He's the author. He wrote the Beis Levi in English in Arts World. It's actually one of the best-selling Arts World Swarm today. And the title is Master, Mastering Tranquility, the insights from the teacher of Yosef Dov Salavechik, Rosh Hashiva Volozhin, exploring Betochen through the eyes, through the wisdom of the Beis HaLevi's teaching. We're going to be going through the Beis HaLevi in the Muda Betochen. So if anybody wants to join, it should be a very uh, Torah Deca program. Please join us. Um, and again, thank you for joining. Um, tonight's show, show, we have this chosen honor of having Ramanus Freeman, who's been here many times. We had a few big, big share of Ramanus, if you remember, one on anxiety, and then we did one on you know, parenting adult children. They were all uh, were famous, and they went around a lot, and hopefully tonight will be the same thing. We're going to turn to Coach Manach, first for an opening, and also for a uh, gamach here for tonight's share for 162. Okay, so I do want to welcome everyone. We are here on a Monday night. And welcome back, everyone. And uh, we'll start with the gematria. Our Noyach left us with the gematria 162. It is gematria Lashem Hamlucha. Hopefully tonight, Mitch, and we will get some clarity. The program tonight will, uh, it's going to help us, which we're seeing in the world. Slowly, we're getting some clarity to see Hashem runs the world, and we all try to connect everybody in their own way. So, yeah, we're in a situation where everybody is looking for clarity. Many people have questions. We want answers. To be with questions without answers is hard, it's hard to sit with. Um, you know, whether it's, this is Melchemes, Goy Gemogoy, everybody wants to know, what does it mean? There's fear of the unknown, anxiety, and we don't know how to connect, even though Baruch Hashem, we see Claudia Yisrael is uniting, and it's really unbelievable, the stories out there, and I always try to say, there are so many Nism in this war. I don't know if you watch the news, if you don't watch, wherever you are, you can, you can see horrible stuff, or you can actually watch, there, listen to so many Nisim. It's really, really unbelievable to see how Hashem really takes care of Klal Yisrael. And hopefully we'll see more and only Nisim. It, it is hard, you know. Sometimes we see things we don't like. And we don't know how to deal with it. So we don't know what to do. But we're trying to focus on that, on those mitzvahs, on the things that we're machazik ourselves. On the learning, on getting together, on chesed, all of that. Hopefully... This is what Hashem wants from us, but we still don't know. So I want to thank Rabbi Manus for coming tonight, helping us to just to clarify. We can ask all our questions, 
and together get the chizik. I know some people would love to have this program every night, get together, have chizik. And, and, you know, what are we doing? Where's this going? What's going to happen now? People don't know where to hold on to. But we have to hold on to Hashem and to His Torah and Mitzvahs. And hopefully tonight we'll get some adracha with that. Thank you so much. After have to unmute. Oshi, unmute. Thank you, Coach Vinachem. Thank you, thank you. Um, okay, so let's just review tonight's topic. The topic has a lot of titles over here, a lot of strong points we want to try to really cover. Number one, why did Hashem let this happen? Number two, our role in time of crisis and exploring world events and the biblical prophecy of Gog and Magog. So at the end of times. So again, Shreyach Rabbi Manas Friedman for coming. Again, I'll just read his bio quickly. He's a world-renowned author, counselor, lecturer, philosopher. Manas Friedman uses ancient wisdom and modern wit as he captives, captivates his audiences across the, across the country and the world. He's widely, he's widely recognized for his thoughtful approach on almost every major issue that plagues society. Self-awareness, spirituality, mysticism, sexuality, parenting, marriage, evidence of his regard and display through thousands of students, fans, and individuals who deeply respect him with his wisdom and compassion. When he takes the podium, Rabbi Friedman enthusiasms each of his listeners with a sense of purpose and a defined direction. Rabbi Friedman has written five books with more on the way, and he has been featured on CNN, PBS, BBC, A&E, TEDx, to name a few. And of course, as I always say, the most famous, Coach Menachem, obviously. Another one of his claims to fame is YouTube's most popular rabbi with over probably more than that already, probably four or 500,000 followers listen to his daily content. So Rabbi Friedman, thank you for joining us and coming here tonight. And uh, we're going to turn over the floor to you and open it up. Tonight's a fully loaded topic. Thank you very much. And uh, let's not waste any time and get right to the meat of the subject. First of all, we are the Am Chacham Venovin, and the Torah is He Chachmaschem Obinaschem Leeinei We have a Torah that gives us true wisdom, and uh, we are the Am Chacham Venovin. We are the the, the people who have Chachma and Bina, and as the joke goes. If the Am Chochem Venovin had a little seichel, <laughs> we would know what to do. The point is, questions are wonderful because questions bring answers. The attitude or the belief that Teva is mysterious and the Eberstedt is mysterious and we don't understand and we don't know and we can't know and we should have the humility of admitting that we don't know this is not Torah. Before the Torah was given, everything was a mystery. Once the Torah is given, and certainly 3,000 years later, all the questions are answered. There is nothing that Torah does not explain and illuminate. Even the things we don't understand, Torah explains why we should not understand. So we approach everything with the Chachma of Torah, not with mysteries, not with, with guesses, not with personal opinions. We know, we know what the Torah says. Obviously, there's a mitzvah, and the Rambam says it's the first mitzvah, to know. You say that, you say this, the Amud HaChachma is Leida. Of course, we believe, we're born believing, the whole, the whole task and the whole mission is to become knowledgeable and get to know Hashem in addition to the emuna. So the first question, why could such a thing happen? Why would Hashem allow such a thing to happen? Any attempt to answer that question is wrong-minded. This is not a question. This is not a pilpul over a teisvis or a nigamara. This is an extremely painful and, and, and unacceptable reality. We don't want an answer. We won't accept an answer. And anyone who thinks he has an answer 
should go back to Cheder. Do we really want to know what is good and right about people dying such horrible deaths? I don't want to know. I don't want to get comfortable with it. I don't want to say, oh, so that's why it happened. I, I understand. No, I don't want to understand. When you're in pain, you don't want to understand. So the attempt to justify or rationalize or make reasonable the suffering of others is completely not kosher. So it's not that we don't have an answer. We don't want an answer. Because if an answer can satisfy your question, you have lost moral ground. You haven't become a better person. You've become a more callous person. That's not where we should be going. Moshe Rabbeinu asked, You sent me to talk to Pare and to take the Yidin out of Mitzrayim. I went to speak to Pare. He got upset and he increased the workload. And now the Yidin are suffering more. Why? Lama. What does the Ebrish to say? No answer. Watch and see how I take the Yidin out of Mitzrayim. But what about the question? The Ebrishta knew that Moshe Rabbeinu doesn't want an answer. He wasn't asking for clarification. He was saying, this is too painful. And the only answer is, watch how I take them out of Mitzrayim. In other words, put an end to the pain. So, are there reasons? Of course. Of course. This is the Ebrishta's world, and everything in the Ebrishta's world happens according to a plan. There are parts of that plan that we want to understand and study and debate and absorb. And then there are parts of the plan we don't want to hear. We don't want to understand. We just want it to end. So the question in this case is better than any answer. Does this make sense? Somebody asked Eli Wiesel, why was there a Holocaust? as if he's supposed to know because he was there. So usually when they ask him this question, he says, why, 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 why do you expect me to know? But one time he answered differently and it was brilliant. Somebody asked him, why was there a Holocaust? And he said, I'm sorry, but I'm not at liberty to tell you. The man said, you know why, but you won't tell me? He says, that's right. He said, why can't you tell me? He says, because if I tell you, you'll become a Nazi. The man says, I'm Jewish. How would I become a Nazi? Here's what Wiesel said. You're asking me why there was a Holocaust, because it hurts you, it bothers you, it doesn't let you sleep. So you say, why? Why? Now, I have a good answer, and I'll give you that good answer. And you're going to say, I see, aha, so that's why. Okay, I can sleep now. You've become a Nazi. When we ask, why do the righteous suffer? We don't want an answer. It's not so much a question as it is lodging a complaint. And when we see people suffering, we must complain. That's our obligation from Hashem. That's what he expects of us. And he doesn't want us to get comfortable with a good answer. The only good answer for six million Jews dying is that the six million Jews come back. That would be a good answer. Anything else I don't want to hear. So, why did Hashem let this happen? Even if there is a good answer, 
it will never be good enough. We should never become callous to where a good answer can remove the pain. So what do we need to know? We need to know how are we supposed to live with this? What are we supposed to do about it? What are we actually seeing? And this is a real profound topic. What are we seeing? We are seeing another example where evil seems to be successful and the good and the decent seem to be the victim. Is this anything new in our history? And the pain of the fact that the evil can can be successful in causing pain to the good and the holy, that's a condition that we cannot tolerate. It can't be. That is the very essential definition of gullus. Gullus means an upside down world where the wicked are prosperous and the righteous suffer. When it's supposed to be the other way around. What is our job? Our job is to balance the scales so that the good outweighs the evil and the evil surrenders and, and disappears. One, one very important. Isn't it amazing that 50 years ago, the attack was on Yom Kippur? And now, 50 years later, the attack is on Simchas Torah. So some people find that to be even more puzzling. Why? Why on Yom Kippur? Why on Simchas Torah? But let's look at, at the facts rather than the why. If the world wants to see what is true, if the world wants to know what is right, take a, take a look. It's so clear and it's so obvious. Who attacked whom? Who are the attackers and who are the victims? There's no mystery. 50 years ago, people who loved to kill attacked people who fast on Yom Kippur. Who are they? They are the murderers. Who are we? We fast on Yom Kippur. A couple of weeks ago, there was another attack. Who were the attackers? People who have pleasure from killing and from seeing blood and from torturing, sadistic people. Who did they attack? People who dance on Simchas Torah. It's so clear. So ask a simple question. The fact that they succeeded and they take that as a sign that they are right, that they are the righteous ones and that God is on their side. What's the proof? They were successful. How foolish is that? How ridiculously absurd. Success means God likes you. If you succeed at being evil, it means you're good. How twisted can you get? Success is worthy and, and positive if you succeed at something worthy and positive. If you succeed at being evil, you're just evil. So it's totally absurd to say, oh, I guess they must be right because they're successful. They're successfully evil means they're very evil. It's also ridiculous to say, since we were victimized and we suffer terrible loss, that proves that we are wrong and that God is not on our side. How absurd is that? So the first thing is, we are very pained. We are very grieved 
But are we embarrassed? Do we feel guilty? Why? The opposite. They are bloodthirsty animals, and we dance on Simchas Torah. Shame on them, not on us. We need to know that, we need to feel that, and we need to express that. We are not the ones in trouble. We're in pain. They are in trouble. Who is they? Here's another important thing. Way too focused on a group of people called Hamas. We would like to think that they are the only depraved people in the Middle East. They're the only depraved people in a decent world. <laughs> we can't be that naive. People who are so cold-bloodedly evil is nothing new. What did the Babylonians do when they destroyed the Beis Hamikdash? They killed babies. We read about it in uh, in, in Tehillim, Al Nardas Bavel. What did the Romans do when they defeated the Babylonians? They killed their babies. Throughout history, people are barbaric. And not ancient history. In the Holocaust, Nazi guards just simply enjoyed the, the opportunity to to kill babies in a very brutal, cold-blooded way. So well, Hamas is like an exception. So I think we should stop acting horrified and repeating, oh, they did this and they did that. How do we know that we shouldn't be horrified? Because on every university campus, all over the world, college students, professors, the educated masses don't see anything wrong with what happened. It's not Hamas. It's a world that for 3,000 years since the title was given, haven't learned a thing have not become better, have not become decent, have not outgrown their barbaric impulses. It's very sad. Who are the, uh, the most indecent? Who are the cruelest? So we learned a lesson from Germany. Germany was a very sophisticated country. Great art, great music, great philosophers, great education, very cultured people, and not a drop of decency. When it comes to morality, they're brain dead. Not despite their education, because of their education. Because secular education is corrupting and it kills your naturally good instincts. We should have learned it from them. We should have learned it then. Watch out for secular education. It does not produce good people. It never has. Reading Shakespeare does not make you a better person. The one thing that was different then is that Nazis didn't do what they did in the name of God. There wasn't that element of blasphemy because they weren't religious. Now we have the exact same evil, the exact same depravity by educated people who are also religious and they mention God as they go about slaughtering people. 
This is worse. So two things that keep people corrupted. Distorted religion and higher education. How shocking is that? The masses, certainly in America, are all for Israel. 87%. So it's a little minority that are very vocal, very vile, and control the, the headlines. But who are those people? The very people who are supposed to teach morality. You always believe if you have an education, if you read books, if you go to college, if you, if you sit around debating philosophy with other thinkers, you're a much more noble person. No, you're not. We also thought that religion would make people good. You believe in God, you believe in the Ten Commandments, you're a decent person. No. Religion can be corrupting. So now the question is, look at the world and tell me what you see. You're looking at a world that has no access to morality. None. There are far more good people today than there were 100 years ago. Not because of education and not because of religion. So if religion won't provide morality, and if education won't provide morality, we pretty much ran out of ideas. What is the hope for this world? When decent people look around, what, what can they believe in? We realized in the last couple of years, communism is a disaster. Democracy is a disaster. Secularism is a disaster. Science, medicine, politics, disasters. So, so there's only one hope, and that is the wisdom of the Torah as it's explained by our sages. This is the world's probably last chance to grow up and become intelligent about morality. That's, that's what we're looking at, and that's the question we have to ask ourselves. Is there hope for this world that God created and has been waiting thousands of years for the world to respond with wisdom, with decency, with godliness? So, of course, we'll defeat Hamas. That's no big deal. And to keep talking about it is wrong. Stop it. Oh, we will defeat them. Just defeat them. Stop making a big deal about it. But then what? Where does that leave the world? And stop saying we have a right to defend ourselves. What are you, a kid in a, in a, in a schoolyard? Oh, we have a right to defend ourselves. Such brilliant insight. Such morality. It's childish. What then is the issue? The world has to become God's world. We keep talking about tikkun olam. Well, take it seriously. We have to be in the world, and we have to bring the world to godliness. How are we going to do this? So now the question is, is this leading us to Mashiach, or is this taking us in the wrong direction? How are we doing so far? Do we have, do we have comments? We can... We're doing great. Doing great. If you want to go to questions, or you want to speak more, whatever you want, Ramana. Questions will bring out the rest. 
Okay. So she wrote her polls. The question will bring out the, all the okay. answers. Okay, Romana's beautiful. Okay, let's take a poll. We'll give you a break for a minute. We're going to ask the, the audience some questions and let's see what they say. And then we're going to jump into live questions. We have a few ready. Again, if anybody wants to ask a live question, you can text us your over here. Uh, live goes first, obviously. And um, there's a lot to ask. Romanus, you could ask him anything. And here we go. Three poll questions. First question. Do you believe that the recent world events are a sign of biblical prophecy of the Goy -Mog Mogog unfolding, the, the final war? So three three possible answers. Number one, yes, it's a clear sign. Number two, I'm not sure it's possible. Number three, no, I don't think it's related. Second question, how do you perceive your role in the times of crisis like this? Number one, I see it as an opportunity for spiritual growth and helping others. Number two, I feel helpless and uncertain about my role. Number three, I haven't thought much about it. Third question. What do you believe is the primary reason for Hashem allowing crisis, such crises to occur? Four possible answers. Number one, to test our faith and resilience. Number two, to, pu to punish humanity for its sins. Number three, to fulfill the pro 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 prophecies and bring about change. Or number four, I'm not sure. It's a mystery. Hashem's, Hashem's ways is a mystery. Those are the three questions to answer however you feel. There's no right or wrong. We'll review with Rabbi Friedman. And then again, anybody wants to ask a question, please text me and let's let's really get to some clarity over here. Let's put another five seconds. Okay. We're gonna end the poll. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, let's share the results. This is what everybody said, Rabbi Freeman. Let's go through it one by one. Do you believe that the recent world events is a sign of the biblical prophecy of Goy Gomog unfolding? So 36% of people say, yes, I think it's a clear sign. 60% of people say, I'm not sure it's possible. And 4%, no, I don't think it's related. Rabbi Freeman, anything to say on that, Paul? I don't know what the war of Goy Gomog is. So guessing is not a good idea. Maybe Goy Gomog already happened. In World War One, World War Two, maybe it happened in the Six Day War. Maybe it happened in the Yom Kippur War. It, it's not. It's not the, the the really important question. The really important question is: Are we getting closer to Mashiach? You want to call it Gogol Mogig, whatever, Gogol Mogul, whatever. Are we getting closer to Mashiach? And what do we do to get closer to Mashiach? So we're not looking for the Muslim and, and hidden Medrashim. We're looking for a plan. Let's go to the second question. How do you perceive your role in the times of Christ like this? Very shocking. 85% of people say it's an opportunity for spiritual growth and helping others. 14% feel helpless and uncertain about their role. 1% haven't thought about it much. So Rabbi Friedman, it seems like most people feel it's a time to really grow spiritually and to be, do there, be there for others. Absolutely. And the third question, what do you believe is the primary reason for Hashem allowing such crises to occur? 26% of the people feel it's to test our faith and resilience. 5% to punish hum humanity for its sins. 29% to fulfill prophecies and bring about change. And 40% of the people, most people say, I'm not sure, it's a mystery, it's Hashem's ways. Like a little bit like you said in the beginning. It is a mystery. But the other answers are not only insufficient, they're, they're actually a little bit cruel. Is Hashem testing our faith? Can you, can you think of anything more cruel than that? He puts us through horrendous, I'm not even going to go over it again. All of that is just to see, to test our faith. That is so cruel. How can you believe that? How can you think that of Hashem? There are many people that feel that way on their personal issues. They have they're going through um, some hard hardships in their life, and they have those thoughts that maybe Hashem is testing their faith. Is it right over there to think that way? Not quite. 
it is a test of your faith. It is testing your faith. Is that why it's happening? God forbid. God forbid to accuse Hashem of such a thing. It's, it, it, it's, it's horrible. Now, the other one is, he's punishing us for our sins. That's even worse. We, we have to get this very clear in our minds. In the olden days, in order to be able to handle all the tzodas that we went through, it was empowering to say, it's because of our sins. We're not just victims to a jungle world who can kill us anytime they want. That's too scary. So to empower ourselves, we said, no, no, it's our own fault. It's because of our sins. We stop sinning, we'll stop suffering. It's actually empowering. It wasn't just blaming and it wasn't just making people feel bad. But that was a long time ago. Today, to suggest that Hashem is disappointed with us, angry at us, and needs to punish us for our sins? After 3,000 years of not hearing from him? After 2,000 years of Golos? He's angry at us? He really is surprised that we're not as knowledgeable in Torah, not as holy, not as devoted. He didn't expect this? What are you saying about the Ebershtah? You're saying he puts us through the most impossible, inhumane history and then blames us that we don't know what Shabbos is? That we don't know what Halig means? Yeah, we don't know. How are we supposed to know? To say that the Eberstedt is disappointed in Yidin, it's, it's, it's absurd. It's not possible. We are incredibly devoted. Even someone who knows nothing about Torah, who knows nothing about, about Kedusha, but he tells his children, no, 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 we're Jewish. He's a hero. He's bigger than life. By our standards today, the man is a tzaddik. So to say that this happened because we are bad, you have to be so cruel and so, such a heart of stone. How could you say that? As long as we're on that subject. People believe, educated people, knowledgeable people, believe that essentially... Hashem doesn't need our mitzvahs. Hashem doesn't need us. Hashem doesn't need the creation. Hashem doesn't need anything. And they have psukim and they have rayas and they have all sorts of things to back up that argument. It is totally, totally wrong. And I've been arguing about this for years. But more recently, after this event, there was this rabbi who I was talking to, and he is so shaken, he's so traumatized. He says, why? Why, did, why could this happen? Why should this happen? Why did Hashem let it happen? Why did he let those people die? I said, because he doesn't need them. He went furious. He says, how can you talk like that? How can you say a thing like that? I said, I'm just quoting you. We, we have to sober up from all of this. To say Hashem is not devastated far more than we are devastated? He is less sensitive to Jewish suffering than we are? What are you doing to Hashem? What are you making him into? And then he tells you to love him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Is this the most absurd thing you've ever heard?
Hashem is hurting far more than we are hurting, which makes the question of why does that happen even infinitely greater. So it's not like we don't like when that happens, but he doesn't care. I mean, you're not even allowed to say such words. He cares infinitely because he's infinite. So now the question is, why is he suffering so much? And if he is suffering from this, this must be so awesome. It must be so in, 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 indescribably important. So to suggest that the Ebershter is angry at his people is anti-Semitic. It's, I mean, it, so no, it is not punishment. And the Ebershter doesn't make you suffer just to get your attention. Stop making him out to be a Kozak. Everybody's throwing their questions, but he's the one who did it. That's exactly what emuna and betochen mean. When something happens that you don't understand, you don't change your relationship with Hashem. You know he's a creator, not a destroyer. You know he's our father. You know we're his only children, firstborn. We know all this. And then something like this happens and we say, oh, I guess not. I just changed my opinion about it. This is called loyalty, this is called trust, this is called emunah. And it doesn't make it better to say, no, 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 Hashem is a tzaddik. The reason these things happened is because we're bad. Does Hashem want to hear that? Really, if he is our father, would he rather that we blame him and be angry at him or that we blame his children? and condemn them as unworthy of his blessings. We got to get our head on straight. This is this is really painful that we're still wallowing in this in this childishness. We are the most incredible part of creation. There is nothing greater. We are holier than angels. We are closer to Hashem than the highest of angels. Why, why do we forget these things? And that's what we should tell the world, by the way. Not we have a right to defend ourselves. We are the chosen people. You have no business starting up with the chosen people. And we're not any less chosen because you can kill us. We're more chosen. And the pity is on you that you haven't let us teach you how to be decent human beings. Abishtad is not on our side. What are you what are you thinking? What are you smoking? Hey Rabbi Freeman, there's tons of questions. Let's get into it, okay? Okay. First live question, you're on. Thank you, Rabbi Freeman. I have two questions. Um, my first one is based on what you were saying earlier, that the fact that the evil was successful, some people might think that, you know, we're bad. Um, my question is, like, from the opposite end. Right now, you know, Israel is being more successful, so to speak. They killed more people, uh, more Gazan children died. Now, we know why. We know that they're human shield and all that. But the world looks at it that, you know, we're committing genocide. We're the killers. We're the oppressors. How do we make sense of that, um, you know, coming from the opposite end that right now we're the killers? Um, and of course, we know why we are, but, you know, now a lot of the anti-Semitism is coming from that side that we're committing genocide. Um, so, you know, the fact that we're successful now makes us look at the, at the bad ones. And my second question is altogether about Medina Israel that so many Jewish lives were lost because of it. Like before Mashiach comes, like what is, 
like what is the Torah de Gai outlook as far as the actual establishment of the state at this time? Okay, so the first the first part. David Amelach says in Tehillim, "Hoy soli demosi lechem yemam v'laila, be'emur elai kol hayoyim ayei alikecha." What is David Amelach crying about? That nobody likes him, that Shoal is out to kill him, that his own son is rebelling against him. He's not complaining about any of this. He is complaining. Why does the world still not know who the Ebershtev is? Why are they still asking Ayeyalikecha? How long will godliness be concealed? How long will the world be in darkness when it comes to the Ebershtev? That's what bothered him. David Amelech marries Batsheva and becomes the grandfather of Moshiach. There is nothing holier in the world. And what did the people say? The people said he's committing adultery. How can you look at holiness and see ugliness? And how can you look at ugliness and think it's holy? That's what David Amalek cries about day and night. And that's what we should be crying about. How long will the world be in darkness? How long will the world not be able to recognize the holiness that is in front of their eyes and distinguish it from the evil that is right under their nose? How can they not know that we are the chosen people? Don't they see Kedusha when they look at it? No, because godliness is still hidden. That's very painful that the Shechina is in Golis, is more painful that we, we are in Golis. Why do yeah, we... I, right? no, I'm sorry, I, I find that, that that is the most painful at this point, the fact that we're always misunderstood, we're always looked at the bad ones. If we're killed, oh, it's because of us. If we killed because of us, it's like so painful to feel like... So let's, or, let's, be, let's be intelligent about this not because we have to answer their questions. We've come to a point where for 70 years we've been debating and arguing, defending, bringing proofs, bringing arguments. It's too embarrassing. If someone would come over to me and say, where's the proof that the land belongs to you? I say, I am not having this conversation. Go back to kindergarten or go back to sleep. I'm not going to degrade myself to get into this conversation. If you don't know that the land of Israel belongs to the children of Israel, then you're beyond hope. You're not intelligent enough to understand an answer. So no more, no more. I'm not arguing with you anymore. Somebody says, we are descendants of monkeys. Fine. You want me to argue with you about this? <laughs> no. No, you're too far gone. You don't know that your your Shalayim is the capital of Israel? Where do you live in a cave? I should prove to you or argue with you about no. No, no more. If you don't know this by now, you're you're just not educable. You're beyond hope. You don't have the intelligence of a, of a kindergarten kid. So no more. Let's stop embarrassing ourselves by arguing. It's terrible to hear that it's still going on after what happened. We're still doing it. We were always here and Yerushalayim was always holy. To stop it. Why are, you at, why are you defending yourself? And to whom? To whom are you defending yourself? To cannibals? No more. In fact, no more talking about how evil they are. Stop being surprised and stop repeating and reporting on every evil thing they do. They don't deserve that attention. 
So who is right in this fight? Oh no, that discussion is over. We're killing too many people. Oh, we'll make an investigation. No, no investigation. If you think that we're killing too many people, then go home. You're not, you're not invited to this, to this conversation among adults. But for our own sake, we can be confused. Jews can be confused and feel guilty. So let's take a look just with simple Seichel Anushi, Seichel Ayosha. Number one, how many times do we have to say, defending yourself from an attacker is not becoming equal to the attacker? Let's not repeat that ever again. Number two, what is this notion of civilians that we are not supposed to be hurting? Is that, a, is that a true concept? Is that a value? Is that morality? Let's take a look. We should not harm the civilian of our enemies. Does Toyota say that? Yes, Toyota says, don't harm a civilian. The practical question is, how do I know who's a civilian? The Israeli soldier is sitting there with a rifle and he's pointing it at people and he doesn't know who, who's, who, who's, the, who's the civilian. Any guy without, a, without a, an army uniform is a civilian. And if a terrorist takes off the, 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 the shmata from his head, all of a sudden he's not dangerous. In other words, it's true. We are not supposed to kill civilians. But we're also not obligated to identify civilians. If civilians want to be safe, identify yourself. You tell me you're a civilian. Don't expect me to figure it out. Yes, I should not shoot civilians, but it is not my obligation to figure out who the civilians are. If you won't tell me you're a civilian, then I'll shoot you. Where is the responsibility? In Mitzrayim, during Makas Bechedes, we were told to put a sign on our doors. Identify yourself as the good guy. If you don't identify yourself, don't expect me to figure it out. So yes, it's true, you don't, you don't harm civilians. But a civilian is someone who waves a white flag. Someone who surrenders, you're not supposed to kill. That makes perfect sense. That is Seichel Hayosha. That is decency. And it is just as decent and just as rational. If you didn't identify yourself as a civilian, then I treat you like a soldier. That's so commonsensical. By the way, the difference between us and them, they are convinced that there are no Israeli civilians. Every Israeli is a soldier, even if you're two years old. It makes sense. Every, every civilian will, can grow up to become a soldier. So no more civilians. We have the opposite. We cannot sacrifice a single soldier because all soldiers are really civilians. That's, that's the question of uh, not harming civilians. Number two. Can I, sorry, can I just ask one further question regarding this? What happens when the anti-Semitism turns into action? It's not just rhetoric. We don't answer their arguments. But okay. when, when they start storming airports and okay. they start... Yeah, yeah, yeah. But let's get finished with our own head before we get to them. The other thing about civilians... If you're a sensitive person and you really don't want to shoot civilians, 
and you certainly don't want to shoot children, then be careful who you shoot. But is it moral to make a statement in public to tell your enemy, I will never shoot your civilian or your children? Is that a moral thing to do? It is the height of immorality. Because look what happened. When Arabs are fighting Arabs, do either one of them use human shields? No, because what would be the point? The only time they use human shields is when they're fighting with Israel, because we told them that we will not shoot their civilians. So guess what they're going to do? Do you see what you just did? You told them to use civilians as shields. You told them to use children as a cover-up for your rockets. You told them, you assured them, every single day you repeated it ad nauseum. Oh, we are very careful. We're going in selectively. We're not going to... You're putting every one of their children in danger. What seems like morality... If it's not in the Torah, it's immoral. We've got to stop saying that. In fact, we have to tell the Arabs, there's a new sheriff in town. There's a new government. We are fanatical. We will shoot anybody, anywhere, if you don't get out of the way. Maybe they'll stop using human shields. One other subject proportionality. There are many Jews who are very uncomfortable because we're killing too many people. It has to be proportional. In World War II, did the Allies think proportional? Was it ever even a subject that anybody ever used the word before? Well, actually, it's part of the Geneva Convention. The Geneva Convention says when you're fighting a war, it should be proportional. But what did that mean? What part of that can we accept based on Jewish values? This is really, really important. Proportionality means like this. My objective is to bring peace to my country for 40 years. That, that is the objective, 40 years of peace. What will it take to bring 40 years of peace to Israel? If it takes killing one Arab or one Muslim or one terrorist, then you can't kill two. If you can achieve peace by killing one person, then you have no right to kill two people. Proportionate means proportionate to the establishment of peace, proportionate to the objective of the war. The objective of the war is to discourage the enemy from attacking you again for at least 40 years. If you can achieve that by killing one person, then you are immoral if you kill two. If in order to have peace, you have to kill 10 people, then don't kill 11. If in order to have peace, you have to wipe out the whole town, then wipe out the whole town, but not two towns. So proportionality doesn't mean you shoot one, I'll shoot one. E even kids in kindergarten realize that's ridiculous. Proportionality means reach your objective and then stop. On the other hand, suppose the news comes out that so far in Gaza, the IDF has killed 20,000 people. And we go into shock. 20,000 people? Whoa, whoa, that's way too much. Let's make a ceasefire. 
that would be the height of immorality. Why? Because killing 20,000 people has not brought peace. So if you stop now, 20,000 people died for nothing. It's almost like saying, you know, we can afford to, to, to destroy 20,000, but 30,000, no, that's too much. Who gives you permission to destroy 20,000 people? Unless it brings peace for 40 years. So what, what is this counting individual body bags? What will it take to bring peace? Don't do more, but don't do less. If you do less, all you're doing is putting a pause on the violence. Five years later, we'll start all over again, and another 20,000 will be killed. There's no morality in not finishing a war. None. Ceasefire. You don't have a ceasefire with people who still want to kill you. So just very simple logic. We're, we're supposed to be smart people. How is it that for 70 years we allowed ourselves to be talked into one ceasefire after another? God gives us miracles, and he'll give us miracles again without any doubt, without any question. But if you're given a miracle, use it to the fullest. Finish the war. Bring peace to the region. No ceasefire this time. Now, the question is, what in fact will bring peace? If we kill a million of them, will it make any difference? In other words, is death a deterrent for them? And if it's not, then figure out what would be. Everybody has their, their weak spot. What would convince them to never try to attack Israel again? What? Whatever it is, do it. And do it quickly. The most moral way to fight a war is to fight it quickly. You don't want a whole generation growing up in, in shelters under, under sirens and knowing only war. Because now you're destroying the next generation. That's not moral. So our morality is this. Fight the war to a convincing victory and do it as quickly as possible. Otherwise, it's cruel and immoral. Okay. Well, let's go to the next question. We have so many questions, Rabbi Friedman. Okay, you're on. Hi, Rabbi Friedman. Thank you for being with us again. So I have kind of like two questions, something on the last statement you just said and something else. Um, at the end of the day, I know you said we should do something that will convince them not to attack again. But if Yishmael is a Torah thing that Yishmael just hates, Call Yisrael. So no matter what we do, uh, you know, in the tziut, uh, upstairs, the way it's ordained in Shemaim, even if we attack everyone, Hashem, the way he made the tziut of the world is that they just hate Call Yisrael. So I don't know what it doesn't mean to fully do something that they won't attack again. And secondly, my main question is, in these times that I find this challenge of balancing living a life of being grounded, not being so moving, not shaken, you know, being, having myself but on the, so I try not to listen to the news, let's say, but when I don't listen to the news, I don't know what's going on. And I feel, I can't feel for others. Um, and also I see like people there, you know, they, they, people, we try to think about the future is this world war three, like everyone said, I, are we supposed to be thinking about the future or live life as if it's now? as if it's regular. Um, I know people bought, got, got their passports ready because if Mashiach comes, how are they going to go ahead and with all passports? Uh, so, um, yes, or all, all over. How do we balance, like, being, living our regular lives, but also thinking about others? 
I don't care if they hate me. As much as they hate me, they have to be more afraid of me and then they won't attack. Because as much as they hate me, they love themselves more. So I'm not asking them to stop hating us. You're entitled to hate me. You're not entitled to shoot me. So the fact that halacha that the saying the ace of Liankiv isn't a hate. Sit and wallow in your hatred, but don't you dare throw a stone at an Israeli soldier. That's what we need to have. And that's just practical. That's self-defense, and that's what the Ebrister says. Do not be afraid of them. Make them afraid of you. He said, "Say la al eivecha." They're not your equal. They're just an annoyance that has to be put to rest. But it's not, there's no debate between you. It's al eivecha, not im eivecha. What should we do? We should do what we've always been doing. And making the world holier. Now it's even more urgent than before. But we've never been passive. And that's another thing. You believe that Moshiach is coming? Or do you believe that Moshiach will come? There's a huge difference. To believe that Moshiach will come is childish, immature, and irresponsible. Mashiach, the world is messed up. Everything is bad. Moshiach will come and he'll fix it all. That's not kosher. We never say Mashiach will come. We say Mashiach is coming. What does that mean? Every mitzvah we do brings Mashiach. It's a process that we're not only in the middle of, we're very close to the end of that process. So Mashiach is coming. Not Mashiach will come. And he's coming because of our mitzvahs, our avodah, our loyalty, our meseras nefesh, this brings and makes Mashiach happen. Now, we should do even more. We should be inspired by the realization that we are the only hope. You know, we say, Ein, ein lono al mi lihi sho'ein elol al avinu shabashamayim. You know what Hashem is saying? I have no hope left except for my children. The rest, can't rely on them at all. So let's get busy doing what we're always supposed to do, what we've been very good at, and now we just got to put in the finishing touches. Let's go to the next question. You're on. Hi, how are you? Thank you so much for doing this. Um, okay, I have a question. If Hashem wants us to be close to him and wants us to have a relationship with him and really loves us, then how does such a thing occur? Because people will get angry at him and will distance themselves from him. And then that connection and that Kesha with Hashem is sort of like deleted. Like they're going to feel angry. They're going to feel Hashem, you know, turn away from me. How, how does like that all tie in to having that connection and love for Hashem if this is what he is doing? It's a very good question. But, but two things, I don't have an answer, but there are two things we have to consider. Number one, when somebody said to me recently, why is Hashem not protecting us? Excuse me, excuse me. How many rockets have fallen on Israel in the last 10 years? How many? 60,000? How many have they killed? Not one? What do you mean Hashem is not protecting us? Do you read the news? For, for all these years, rockets fall and no casualties reported. And that's not a miracle?
you know, when they came across the border, there was nobody there to stop them. But they stopped. Because they couldn't believe. They thought the army is waiting just behind the hill. And if we go any further, they're going to mow us down. Who stopped them? So what do you mean? Why doesn't, the, why doesn't Hashem protect us? All of a sudden, everything that has happened until now, why didn't Hashem protect us in that case? I don't know. I don't know. And I don't, I don't want a good excuse. But to say Hashem doesn't protect us? What kind of, what kind of statement is that? So that's number one. Number two... If a person is angry at Hashem, is that not a good relationship? I'm going to tell you, it'll lighten up the mood a little bit, I'll tell you an interesting story. I think it was Rabbi Steinsaltz. I'm not sure, so I'll just call it the rabbi. There's a rabbi who gives a class in Talmud at the university in Yerushalayim, and all the professors come for 25 years this class has been going on and the professors just love it because the rabbi is brilliant but there was one professor who refused to come all his colleagues invited him he refused to come year after year one time the rabbi met this professor at some event and the rabbi said to him why don't you come to the class? In fact, this year, the class is being held in your building, right down, right down the hall. All your colleagues come, they enjoy. Come, you'll enjoy. This professor said, I don't belong at a, Cal, at a Talmud class, at a Gemara class, and we have nothing in common, so no, I'm not coming. The rabbi said, what do you mean we have nothing in common? What kind of statement is that? The man said, you don't know me. I came to Israel as a teenager from, from Poland after the Holocaust. And since then, I eat chazer on Shabbos. So the rabbi said, only on Shabbos? He says, Dafke on Shabbos. So the rabbi said, you see that? You said we have nothing in common. Look at this. We both observe Shabbos. I do it in the old-fashioned way, and you do it in your own way. The man started coming to the class. But he told the other professors, I'm not here because the rabbi made a good joke. It wasn't just a joke. I heard what he's trying to tell me. Here's what the rabbi was saying between the lines. You don't belong at a Talmud class and we have nothing in common. Why? Because you're angry at God. And you want to spite him, punish him. So you eat Chazer and Dafka on Shabbos. So listen to yourself. You believe in God. Otherwise, who are you angry at? You believe that God runs the world, and therefore, whatever happens is his responsibility. You also believe in Torah that says that Chazer is against God's will, which is why you chose to eat Chazer, to spite him. But you were eating Chazer, and it didn't feel like enough of a punishment. So you decided to make it even more of a punishment by eating a dafka on Shabbos, because Shabbos is a holy day. So you believe in Hashem, you believe He runs the world, you believe in kosher, you believe in Shabbos. You're practically orthodox. You don't belong at a Talmud class. You belong there more than many Jews who uh, think they belong there. If a Jew is angry at God because of Jewish suffering, 
that's a good Jew. So we can't say that because of this, Jews turned away from God. They did not turn away. They can't stop thinking about God. God is so real to them, it boils their blood. That's Bechol Levavacha. But the question is still a good question. Why does the Abishta want them to be angry at him when they can also love him? But we should not. We should not think that the Abishta is going to turn Jews away and he doesn't care. He does. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Barbara Friedman, let's go to the next question. You're on. Hi. Hi. Yeah, thank you, Rabbi Friedman. Um, it's a bit different, this question, but it's about the kids that end the war. Like how, and he even brought the question for me more, like I get very, um, like how do you deal with a kid? Like if I don't understand myself and they have so many questions um, and I feel bad when they're in pain about it or they get anxiety about it, like how do you deal with it? And then I heard you say that Hashem is in even more pain. So then I like felt even more bad that we do we need to feel bad for Hashem? Do like how do we relate to that? Yes, you see, Avraham served God with Ahava. Avraham Ehavi. Yitzchak served served God with Pachad. Pachad Yitzchak. Yaakov served, served God with Rachmanus. What does it mean to have Rachmanus on the Ebrishter? The Ebrishter has a purpose. The Ebrishter has a kavana. The Ebrishter wants the world a certain way. And, it's, and it, it's taking long. It's taking too long. Now, the Neide Yehuda writes that Hashem is depending on us and Hashem is mispalel to us. Just like we are mispalel to him, he is mispalel to us. And that's the meaning of base C, based fila, or based fila C. Based fila C, the Gemara says, means the, da, the place where Hashem davens. So the Neid of Yehuda says, to whom does he daven? And the answer is, to Yidin. Where do you see this? And this is really beautiful. It's a, it's a sensitive perception. The Pesach says, Mo Hashem elekecha sheyel me'imach ki im liyira oisei. What does Hashem ask of you other than to serve him? Hashem asks of you. Shouldn't it say Hashem demands of you? Hashem is shoyel me'imach. That's called a tefillah. So, so yes, yeah, so Hashem does hurt more than we hurt, and we should have Rachmanus on him. That's Yaakov's style. And we are the Bnei Yaakov more than we are Bnei Avram and Yitzchak. We are the Bnei Yisrael. So what should we tell our children? That is a really crucial and, 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 and seriously responsible question. What do we tell our children? First of all, most of the conversation has to be on the miracles that Hashem is performing and protecting us from very, very evil people. That must be the, the main part, the bulk of the conversation has to be how Hashem is protecting us because we are his favorite firstborn, B'nai Yechidei. What about the evil? There are some very bad people in the world and the good people have to make the world better so that the bad people stop being bad. In other words, we're not passive about that. Oh, there are bad people. Who knows what they're going to do to me? No, there are bad people, and we 
have to over out, outweigh them and bring the bad people to become good. You don't have to mention that if they don't become good, we have to shoot them. <laughs> Can I ask a follow up on that? Sure. How do we handle that if we have Rahmunas on Hashem, like not to overtake us, that it shouldn't disturb our lives? Why would it overtake you? Having Rahmanas on the Ebishter is is magnificent. It's a strong emotion. Yeah, but it's not an emotion that hurts. To have Rahmanas on somebody. So just compassion. That's what it is, yeah. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's it's a more realistic emotion than Ahava and Yira. Ahava is hard. And Yira can be very angry and very, like you say, very overwhelming. But Rahmanas? It's the safest emotion. And that's why it's for everybody. The Bnei Yaakov were all Sadiqim. There was no Esav and there was no Yishmael. Yaakov is for everybody because Rachmanus is is a uh, is a very doable and very reasonable uh, emotion that everyone can can experience to their benefit. Okay, let's go to the next one. You're on. Hi, right, thank you. Um, I belong to a community that doesn't support going to the IDF. Is it right to support the war effort like by sending the sweaters, food, money? Um, etc. And also, um, we always know that like Tyra is, we're supposed to be learning Tyra not, you know, that's our Aveda. Question is now that the war is happening and everyone's supporting the IDF and boosting them. My question is if, is, are we supposed to be learning Tyra or do our child listen fight, which is truly more important. Sometimes I feel like if I don't, if I'm not helping, I feel like I'm using my ideals to get out of the fire in the front line. First, let's agree that every soldier is an absolute tzaddik. No. He's putting his life in danger to protect the Abishta's people. Can you get holier than that? One of the amazing positive things is you're hearing Rabbonim in Eretz Yisrael, who always felt completely estranged from the government, from the people, from the soldiers. And to them, the soldier was like an ugly creature and you don't want to have anything to do with them. That has changed so dramatically. All of a sudden, to every Jew in Israel, the soldiers are the holiest of the holy. And everyone is davening for them and everyone is doing whatever they can to support them even barbecues. It's so nice to see that. Finally, finally, after all these years, we are Am Echad. So let's agree that any kid who puts on a uniform is, is, is from the Melchemes based David. David HaMelech made an army and went to war. All those people could have been sitting and learning or saying to Hillam. David Amela said, no, 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 close the Tehillim and come fight for the Abishta's people. Fight for the Abishta. Like Goliath, the worst part about Goliath, Goliath, was that he was making fun of the Abishta. So that that is that is a given. Every soldier is is the pre the most precious of the precious. Should everybody drop the Gemara and go to war? I'm not sure that that would help the war effort. Not everybody is cut out to be a soldier. Not everybody is cut out to be an activist or a, a public servant. People who are good at learning are probably not so good at shooting. 
So if you're good at learning, then that's your contribution to B'nai Yisrael. If you're good at war, at organizing, at, at making things happen, then make that your contribution. So it's not all or nothing. Not, nobody should go to the army, and now all of a sudden everybody should go to the army. We don't need the extremes. If you can help the army, that is the mitzvah of the hour. And if you can sit and learn Bahasmada, then that is your mitzvah of the hour. So ask yourself, what is the better or the greater contribution that you can make? They're both vital, equally vital. Okay, here's a question that somebody sent in. Let me read it. I'm experiencing anxiety and nervousness, and my thoughts often lead me to dwell on the worst possibility, possible scenarios. How can I learn to rely on Hashem and find peace amidst these troubling thoughts? You know, different people give themselves different arguments that help. The Abish that protected us for 3,300 years, all of a sudden he's going to quit? Why in the world would he do that? People have, people think back to times where they don't like to think back. The war, war times, and that's what they remember. They don't, maybe they don't remember the times that Hashem protected us. The fact is we're still here. The whole world wants to get rid of us for 2,000 years, and we're still here. So we're not going anywhere. The miracle is going to happen. The question is today or tomorrow? It would be nicer if it was today rather than tomorrow. But that there's going to be a miracle, that this is going to be a great year for Yidin, what's the question? What's the question? I mean, unless you think that the Ebershed is ready to destroy the whole world and call off the whole project and go back to being the only thing in existence, that's not going to happen. The Ebershed's plan will succeed and the world will become holy. Not only will Jews still be here and Jews will still be healthy and strong, the whole world will become godly. Every human being will recognize that Hashem Aleke Yisrael is Melech. That's what's going to happen without a doubt. Because the Ebishta doesn't like to fail. And it's his project. So it's not because we're so powerful. It's because he's so powerful. Why would he fail at his project? His project is every human being will serve him in peace, together with the Yidden, and we will be their teachers, and they will be the students, and the world will be Hashem's world. If you believe in Hashem, then that's you, you know that that's what's going to happen. That's why we're so sure Mashiach is going to come. <laughs> Not because we trust Mashiach. We trust the Ebershter, who wants Mashiach more than we do. You know, the Rebbe was the first uh, leader, tzaddik, who, who, who used the phrase, we want Mashiach now. And some people were a little shocked. Isn't that a little brazen? We want Mashiach? What do you, how do you talk to Hashem like that? It's a good question. When the, when the Rebbe said, we want Mashiach, Who's the we? We sitting here in 770? We means the Eberstedt and the Yidden both want Mashiach. So the Rebbe's question is, you want Mashiach and we want Mashiach. No. So what's the holdup? Not we're telling the Eberstedt that we want Mashiach, and he doesn't. I mean, he doesn't. He wants Mashiach much more than we do. You know, we'll be content if we can just have a nice neighborhood where people leave us alone. We'll be happy. 
Maybe it still won't. So we want Mashiach. And it's a total mystery. Why is he not here? Is there something the world needs to learn before they're ready for Mashiach? Well, they just learned it last week. So is this bringing us closer to Mashiach? Incredibly so. The fact that all universities are violently pro-Hamas, doesn't that mean Mashiach is here? Do you think this can go on? Do you think the world is so completely ignorant that they don't realize what a mess, what a disaster they are? Sure, they'll try to justify it, and, but it's not going to work. They're going to admit that they are messed up. They don't know right from wrong. They don't know men from women. They don't know anything. And they are desperate for Jews to lead the way. It is so obvious. It's so clear. It's a miracle that it didn't happen last night. That the world wakes up and says, okay, we're, we're, we give up. We don't know. There are many, many liberal Jews for whom we have to have a lot of Rahmanas. Because they're looking at themselves now and they're saying, we were urging Israel to make peace with these, with these people? We were complaining and criticizing Israel for not making peace with these people? They're so ashamed of themselves. How could we have been so blind and so stupid and so insensitive and so unloyal to my own people? Everywhere, liberal Jews are having a, a mental breakdown. Unfortunately, uh, it's that serious. But what have you been doing? Sure, there are still some Jews who are not giving in. Yeah, if we had been nicer to them, they wouldn't be animals. That's like being nice to a snake, and then he wouldn't be a snake. No. Okay, let's go to the next live question, Robert Freeman. Okay, you're on. First of all, thank you, Rabbi, for giving these words of Chizuk. At the end of your earlier presentation, you mentioned that what are we supposed to do now? I don't know if that was rhetorical or if you have an answer to that. What are we supposed to do now? We're supposed to become so proud of our Jewishness. You know, 2,000 years of abuse can do a lot of damage to people's self-image. We are very damaged. Let's not kid ourselves. We can't come through 2,000 years of, of, of abuse and be healthy. It's not possible. We have a very serious inferiority complex. As much as, you know, we walk around saying, uh, no, we have a very deep-seated inferiority complex. We have to heal. Now is a great opportunity to say, what are we ashamed of? We're the best thing that ever happened to the world. What are we ashamed of? We have nothing to apologize for, and we have nothing to be ashamed of. Jewish pride we need it. We need it immediately. So take off the yarmulke. Hide your mitzvahs. Hide your Jewishness. No, the opposite. The exact opposite. If you want the world to respect you, be obviously, visibly Jewish with pride and with confidence. That's what I was saying before. No more arguing. No more arguing. It's over. We try to educate you. You don't listen. You don't get the answers. All you want to do is repeat your questions. So no more. No more. 
it's like a classroom. And the students are swinging from the chandeliers and climbing on the drapes. You can't teach like this. So the classroom has to settle down, get into your seats, sit quietly, and we'll help you become a mensch. That's our attitude to the world. Pride, confidence in everything Jewish. We do, you know, we do Kiddush Levana. Feels a little funny to be standing out in the street talking to the moon. Oh yeah? Well then let's do it with a band and with a performance and with singing and with a chazan. Let's light up the street and let everybody see that we talk to the moon because we're good and holy. And that's what good and holy people do. No more hiding, no more apologizing, no more defending. We've been on the defensive for so long. It's terrible. No more. It doesn't seem to work anyway, so it's a waste of time. <laughs> yeah. We have to add insult to injury. Okay, there's so many more live. Let's try to cover some more, Robert Friedman. Um, okay, you're on. Hi. Um, so I have a question. Basically, I live in New York, and like obviously there's not anything like, there's no like known threats or whatever, but a lot of times I'm just like worried. Like, oh, just like the Israel, they got like someone knocking on their door and just killing them. The same thing could happen to me. And my husband's always saying like, no, just think good and we'll be good. Like Hashem's protecting you. But the thing is like, if he didn't protect them, why would he protect me? It's not like I'm any better or worse than them. So is there anything like practical you could tell me that like I could tell myself in these situations, like just like walking down the street or whatever it is? Well, yeah, I want to tell you something interesting. I heard this clip of a of a Muslim, the son of a, of, a, of a Hamas leader. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. So I think it was him who said, Israel are the aggressors? If Israel was the aggressor, they would have bombed Lebanon out of existence. They would have bombed Syria out of existence because they can do it in a minute. If they wanted to destroy us, we would have been destroyed by now. It's, a, it's, a, it's, an, it's something to think about. But let's apply this in reverse to the Ebershter. What happened over there on Simchas Torah, it could happen any night, any time, anywhere in the world. Why doesn't it? Why hasn't it? I don't know. Somebody asked the Rebbe many, many years ago, can the Holocaust happen in America? The Rebbe said, Morgen in the free. What do you mean, can it happen? Of course it can happen. But if the Eberstes says no, it's no. You know that they announced a day of rage, remember? Yeah, I was really scared that day. Yeah, so what happened? Nothing. Not in Crown Heights. Nothing happened. Exactly. Rabbis machshoves belev sas Hashem hisokom. So they're screaming, they're threatening. Nothing is going to happen because the Eberish that doesn't allow it. Why did he allow it? That's that's an anomaly. That's out of character for Hashem. It's not his habit. It's not what he does day at day, day in and day out. It's a mystery, but his protecting us is no mystery. He does it all the time. Okay, Rev. Freeman Gavaldik, let's go to the next question. You're on. Okay, thank you, Rabbi Friedman. I admire you tremendously, and I'm in the middle of reading your book, How to Live a Life That Matters, and it's making a very big difference in my life. Thank you. Um, my question is, how do you survive and thrive in a closed-minded society with an open mind, especially in these challenging times when Hashem reveals himself through brutal nesiyahness like never before, calling out to us loud and clear? Let, let's be careful with the use of words. Are we going through a nesiyah? A nesiyah means... I don't understand what's happening. This is not in the Soyan. We understand exactly what's happening. The world has not improved enough to stop being barbaric.
it's our job to bring more godliness and more goodness to the world. Maybe they'll eventually grow up and stop being barbaric. Where, where's the mystery? Sure, we don't understand why 1,400 Yiddish, Yiddish and the Shomis had to go through uh, painful, yeah, we don't understand. But what's happening in the world? <laughs> There's no mystery. In fact, it's clearer today than it ever was. Because in the past, like for example, communism. Communism presented itself like the savior of the working class. They were going to make the world better by championing the working class and giving them rights and making everybody equal. Comrades, we're all going to be... They were pure evil, but they presented themselves like angels or, you know, there were Yidin who actually said communism is Mashiach. It was that confusing. That's why so many Jews became communists. It seemed like such a moral argument, such a moral revolution. We, that's an Nisoyen. How were we supposed to know that they would turn out to be so bad? But today we have no Nisoyen. You don't know who the good guys are and who the bad guys are? <laughs> They're not hiding. They have no shame. They're so arrogant, they don't think they need to lie about what they want and what they're intending and what they're not. There's no Nisoyen. There's just a big job to get done. So, you know, there, there are things that are Nisoyenes, and then there is the dirty work that we have to do to clean up a messy, a messy world. So really, there, there's no, there's no justification for Jewish leaders causing panic. It's not right. It's not good. It's not kosher. Oh, this is going to be a long war. No, nobody asked you. What it's going to be is what the Abishta makes it be. Why, why are you saying such things? We are faced with the biggest challenge we ever... Okay, stop with the dramatics. You don't cause panic. You don't frighten people. It's not healthy. It's not kosher. It's not allowed. People have to feel confident. People have to feel safe. So, I don't know. By Kriyas Yamsuf, the Torah says... Hashem yilochem lochem va'atem tacharishun. Two conditions. Hashem will do your fighting, but you have to be quiet. Why is that a condition? And if the Ebershter is doing miracles, shouldn't you be singing and dancing and not being quiet? I think, and you be quiet was addressed to the politicians. I want to add to my question, um, talking about Nisianus, we're talking about the immorality in the world and the political dynamics of the world, mm -hmm. that there are such Nisianus and no clarity. Not for us. We are very clear. Yes, there are some Jews marching in, 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 in solidarity with the Palestinians. Yeah, they're never so far for blunge they don't know they don't even know what they're protesting they really don't know so yes they, they have an Nisoyen. we don't have an Nisoyen. it is so clear it is so obvious okay so, Rabbi, let's let's go to the next question the politicians really need to be quiet Stop saying things that you're going to be embarrassed by, like we have a right to defend ourselves. It drives me crazy every time I hear that. It's, it's so embarrassing. You're a leader. Talk like a leader. What is wrong with you? 
for we're a democracy. We're the only democracy. That is so pathetic. That is so shallow. You think anybody believes that you're a democracy? You think anybody is impressed that you're a democracy? Democracy is in shatters. Tell the world who you really are. Why do you keep lying when it doesn't even help? Tell the world, we are the children of Israel, descendants of Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. The land belongs to them, and we inherit it from them. It's our land. You don't agree? Then go live in Miami. I'm not going to argue with you. At this point in history, if you don't know that Israel belongs to Israel, the land belongs to the people, then I... I'm embarrassed to be in a conversation with you. That's Jewish pride. And the politicians should stop making fools of themselves. We are going to wipe out them. Okay, okay, just do it. Stop with the. Be quiet. You're making a fool of yourself. And you've been doing it for 70 years, over and over and over. The same title with the same words, the same. And it hasn't made a dent. Quit already. Stop it. Try something real. Tell the world in the United Nations, the land belongs to us. It's in the Bible. Good night. There's nothing more to say. For Freedom Gavaldic. Then we'll get some respect. Yeah. Okay, let's go to the next one. You're on. Um. People say that we find ourselves in an ace rut, ace Sarah, and in an ace din. That Hakadosh Baruch Hu is dealing with us now in in a time of din. How do we handle this situation, looking at it through this lens? Whoever said that should do tshuva. I'm serious about this. Whoever said that needs to do tshuva, a serious tshuva. So sit and fast for three days. What a horrible thing to say. The whole thing started on Simchas Torah. On Simchas Torah, God is judging us? It's a time of, of din? What are, you, what are you saying? What are you talking about? This habit of blaming ourselves, it's not good. It doesn't apply anymore. It's not true anymore. It's a chilul Hashem to say that the Eberstedt is punishing us. For what? For what? Ugh, it's horrible. Whoever said that, and they said it in public, they're going to have to do tshuva for the rest of their lives. Um, can I continue with the question? Um, people said, I mean, I heard one person say, say this, and he said it's because of all the um, divis divisiveness that was happening in Eretz Israel before this happened, you know, between the Haredi and the Chiloni and all the fighting that was going on. And 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 um, that could have, you know, aroused or evoked HaKadosh Baruch Hu's wrath. I don't know. If, I'm saying I, I'm, I don't know if I should believe that, but but I heard that being said. And when it's not that, it's because we talk too much Lash and Hara. And if it's not that, it's because we're not Sneas enough. And if it's not that, it's because we're not keeping Shabbos. They always find a way of blaming us. It's a horrible thing for which they have to do tshuva. They really have to beg the Ebershter for forgiveness. Look, Meisha Rabbeinu said to the Ebershter, I should go tell the Yidin, that, that the time of the Geula has come, they're not going to believe me. And the Ebershter said, watch it, you're talking about my children. What, what did Moshe say? He said, they're not going to believe me. And the Ebershter was offended. To say that the people are so bad that they deserve wrath, you're out of your mind. It's anti-Semitic to talk like that. 
Thank you. Somebody, somebody came for the Rebbe. You can see it on a clip. It's, it's all available. A very holy man came to the Rebbe and he said that he had been traveling recently and he sees that many Yidin are having trouble with Parnassa. There's a lot of poverty in, in the Jewish world. And he says to the Rebbe, they're having trouble with Parnassa, probably because they're not mechaven, they don't have kavana, when they say in Ashrei, Peseyach es yodecha, hu masbiya l'chol chayrotzen. So the Rebbe laughs, and the Rebbe says, wait a minute, I'm trying to figure out, are you for the Jews or against the Jews? You want them to have Parnassa, and then you condemn them that they don't deserve Parnassa because they don't have Kavana. Are you for us or against us? What are you doing? How can you claim to have love of Jews and constantly condemn them as deserving of... of... How do you... I don't, I, I, I don't understand these people. We don't get along. There were protests in the streets. And for that, your children should be... Say it out loud. I want, I want to hear one of these people say it out loud. What happened there on, on, on Simchas Teira is what we deserve because we don't get along. Shema <laughs> Shemayim. It's scarier than what Hamas did. You're one of us. You're a Jewish leader. You learn Torah. What are you saying? A lifetime of tshuva, and hopefully that will be enough. Now, is it true that when we're divided, we are more vulnerable? Well, of course. Of course. For free, when somebody's writing Korban Beis Amid, this happened because of sinners, things happen because of you them fighting. First of all, you have to be the Gemara to say that. Not every Shmendrik can make statements like that. Secondly, you have to understand what the Gemara means. The Korban Beis Amigdash is a prop, is a, an appropriate punishment for not getting along. This, this needs a pirush. But look, practically speaking, it's a fact. They decided to attack this year because they felt that they might succeed since we're so divided. So did the protests in the street embolden the enemy? Yeah, of course it did. But it deserves this for a punishment? What, one has nothing to do with the other. It's like a, per, a soldier gets shot. You say, oh, it's because he wasn't wearing his helmet. No, no, no. He didn't get shot for not wearing his helmet. But not wearing the helmet caused more damage. With the helmet, there went less damage. So be careful how you interpret things. Is division among Jews dangerous? Of course it's dangerous. It encourages the enemy. But the enemy's success is what we deserve because we're... That, that, that's insane. Atem <laughs> tacharishon. If you don't know what you're saying, don't say anything. Let's go to the next one. You're on. Thank you so much, Rabbi Friedman. Thank you. Wow. And um, thanks for this opportunity. Um, so we are not, you're there, you know, we talked, you're, we're not to kill a civilian if we know it's a civilian. And so my question is, you know, what do we do in situations like the Shiva hospital where we know, we know there's civilians there and they cannot come out, you know, to wave a white flag. And even if they tried, most likely they would be killed by Hamas. So how can we do 
what Hashem wants us to do. How do you know they're civilians? Because they're in the hospital? Yeah, the hospital, if they're especially if there's infants, the maternity wards, I mean these are these are surely not soldiers. So every adult is responsible to make it clear that their children are civilians, not tools of war. If you turn your children into a tool of war, they're not civilians. They're your ammunition. Somebody just texted a good point. Don't forget, at the end of the day, they elected Hamas as their leaders. There was an election many, many years ago. They chose this. And have you heard any Palestinians say, we hate them, they don't represent us? Yes. Yeah. Where? Yes, I've heard um, there's been a number of posts on Instagram where their identity has been you know, not listed, but their voices are saying that and saying that if they were given the opportunity to surrender, they would. Yeah, and this guy, the Hamas guy, the interviewer asked him, are the, are the Palestinian people in Gaza behind and supporting Hamas? His answer was very interesting. He said, I can tell you one thing. When Hamas is destroyed, we will dance in the streets. Yeah, exactly. That, what, what that's the... not a good answer for our dilemma. How do we know which of you yeah. are going to dance in the streets? Start dancing, then we'll know. <laughs> We don't know, but with the children. I'm getting I mean, into politics. One second, I'm sorry, but getting into politics, what's shocking to me is the whole world could scream at Israel, but like you have Egypt and Jordan, all these countries that could accept at least a woman and children, they're right there, yeah. and yeah. they shut it, and nobody, like that is the biggest genocide more than anything, but Absolutely. instead they're calling, it's like mind-boggling to see that there's no like anger towards Egypt when they That's have a real solution. So we, we, we tried not to talk about how bad they are. We're talking right. about how healthy we need to be. Yeah. We should not be intimidated by these arguments. Instead of saying, oh, we're so sorry, we're, we'll be more careful not to kill civilians. We should say we will kill as many as we need to because this is a war. You brought it on yourself. Stop quetching. We're going to kill as many as we need to. We're not going to be careful, and we're not going to apologize. And, and another so, funny thing, another funny thing is that they're not even offering to give back. The, like, there's no like, they're, they're still hostages. It's not like they're trying. Like, exactly. like, like that's that's already not even a, that's not even a talk. That's not even a conversation. Yeah. yeah, and if those hostages are, you know, say they let us know, well, okay, this tunnel that you're about to bomb or this hospital you're about to bomb, well, they've, we've got your hostages there. Yeah. Um, whether it's true or not, we would never know, Look, but even, even we're given that information. Even President Biden, in an off-the-cuff remark, somebody said they offered to return the, pal the, the, the hostages if you stop shooting. He said... No, first they return the hostages, then we'll stop shooting. It's such an obvious thing. Completely. They have to do what they have to do because rockets are falling on Israel. If you don't stop that immediately, you're an irresponsible government and step down and let somebody else do the job. The truth is they're doing this for years. That's part of the problem. They, they allowed the rockets. It was a normal part of life. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So a real peace would be if you threaten us, we wipe out your city. Not if you shoot at us. It never comes to shooting. If you threaten, if you're gathering weapons, we bomb you out. That's called self-defense. That's what every country would do. And has done. Pearl Harbor. I mean... Well, should do. I, I feel like because they know the Yidin are Rahmanah b'nei Rahmanah, because we have Rahmanas, because we are an right. Am that, that has that softness, they 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 extort that Koyach and they use it. Like you said, like if two Arab countries, they wouldn't even put the kids in. Like they, they know it's not even a conversation. But because they know that that we're that softiness, they 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 take advantage of that of that part. But look at what happened to Shaul Hamelach. He went to war 
like he was told to go to war against Amalek. And he wiped them out, except for one guy, one. And he lost the whole Malucha. You are not a responsible protector of your people because you let the enemy live. So step down and let somebody else do the job. One. Absolutely. Thank you. And um, and can I ask one other question? Different note. Um, Just thinking about so many times in history where the peaceful minority or the peaceful majority actually has gone unnoticed or, you know, making a difference and the minority, the radicals have done so much damage. And I'm wondering, being 0.2% of the population, do we have more of a charge, more of a a call to stand up and to be more vocal and to say more than was said in the past, even thinking back, you know, God forbid, in the, the Holocaust where too many remained quiet. Is it, do we have, should we be challenging ourselves to be more vocal, to be more outspoken, to get outside of our comfort zone and yes. do more? Yes. Say more. For a simple reason. Back then, the average silent majority member didn't know what was going on. They didn't see pictures, they didn't have reports, they didn't have an inter- an internet. They were out of the picture. And even if they heard about it, it was like, I don't know, is that true? Is it an exaggeration? Even Jews in America didn't know for a long time and couldn't believe the reports. Today, you see the pictures, everybody sees it, everybody knows. So the silent majority is much more informed today than ever before. And they have a voice because there's an internet, social media. So yes, we all should be more involved. However, not involved in debating with the evil people. None of that. You see these clips, a guy goes and and, at a protest and he starts arguing. Where, Where does that lead? It leads to violence. That's not, that's not what you do. We do have to do something to bring an improvement, but arguing with them and debating with them just gives them more fuel. And, and it's, it's degrading. It's, you wrestle with someone who's filthy, you become filthy. You know, don't, don't want to get even that close to them. No. So what do we do? We say more to Hillam because that always helps. We help in any way we can, the soldiers, the, the people in Israel, those who are displaced by the war. We got it. We got to support the system in whatever way we can. But arguing with the bad guys, not a word. Does education to the uneducated serve? right now, like we look at these college campuses and what's happening, and so many of them really don't know even what they're doing or why they're doing it, because they just don't have the education or they're miseducated. Does, is there a role for us in that? Mm One-on-one. You happen to know a Jewish kid who is so fablungent and so confused, doesn't know up from down? Sure, talk to them, but not to a mob. And not to the anti-Semite. What you should say is, educate the people to what a chosen people is, what the Torah is, what God is, all the things, the fundamentals that they push it don't have in their system. And because they don't have the fundamentals, you can't argue who's right and wrong. They don't know what right or wrong means. So bring back the, the basics, stick to the basics. No matter what they say, your answer is, but God said that it's ours. God gave it to us, we can't give it away. Can't argue with that. You can say, I don't believe in God. Oh, well, that's your problem. Yeah, it's, it's very painful to watch so many you know, quote unquote, now speaking about a lot of these teachers, professors um, that 
are educated, quote unquote, and some even, you know, children or grandchildren of Holocaust survivors. And their investment is in purely in the worldly knowledge. And it's, it's really painful. It's really painful to watch. Because they're Jews, you know. So Can I tell you a final story? When Golda Meir was, was prime minister, she was on her way to the United States for a summit meeting with the president. So before she arrived, there was a press conference in the White House. Spokesman for the, for the, uh, for the president was asked, what, what is going to be the main topic that they're going to be discussing? So of course, it was two-state solution or whatever. And he made a joke. He said, we're hoping that Golda Meir doesn't come here with a Bible under her arm and say, it's our land because it's in the Bible. Hmm. And everybody laughed. But the editor of the Yiddish paper happened to be there as part of the press. So he asked the, the, uh, the, the speaker, would it bother you if she came with a Bible under her arm and said that the Bible says it belongs to us? And he got really serious and he said, look, we're, we're not officially a religious state, a Christian state. But if it says in the Bible, we can't ignore it. Mm. And that's the one weapon we've never used. Mm. It's time that the, the, the spokesman for the Jewish people, the prime minister of Israel should come to the UN with a yarmulke and with tzitzis. You're representing the Jewish people, look like a Jew. When Saudi Arabia comes, you know who they are because you can't give them champagne because they don't drink liquor and you can't make a meeting on Friday because it's their prayer day. And there was one occasion where some Arabs came, Muslims came to Washington and they were scheduled to have a meeting on Friday. And they said, no, 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 not Friday. We don't meet on Friday. So it was rescheduled for Sunday. And the Muslims had a very good laugh. You, you, you hypocrites, you're Christians. Sunday is your holy day. You don't care. <laughs> we are so much better than you. Yeah. Now, there is a kosher kitchen, by the way. The White House has a kosher kitchen, but, <laughs> but ask for it. You're the prime <laughs> minister of Israel. Ask for meals from the kosher kitchen. You'll get respect from people. Yeah. But to get up there without a yarmulke and to say, but we're a democracy. <laughs> You're making a fool of yourself. Nobody in the Middle East wants a democracy. What are you talking about? Every time you say you're a democracy, they want to kill you more. What are you doing? <laughs> and every administration, every prime minister makes the same mistake? It's like Eric Friedman, let's, let's, let's do one more live, and then we have two more questions, and let's, let's wrap it up because it's getting late. Let's just do one more live, and then I have two more questions I really want to cover with you tonight that came in. Okay, I'll mute. Hi. Hi. I'm mute. I'm mute. Hi. Hi. Okay, I'm unmuted. Thank you. Hi, Rabbi Friedman. How are you? It's good to see you. Um, oh, where, where are you? I am in Brooklyn. Oh. Yeah, I sat with you once in your office about two years ago, and it was a big slush, so I'm happy to see you again. Um. I have a question. I tried to wriggle my way out of it because asking a question in my head and then being prepared to say it out loud, I feel a little bit foolish, but um, it's been weighing on me, so I'll ask you. I have a huge bitachon, very unusual. I do almost no hishtados in my life, and I have things that I should do hishtados for, but I choose to rely on Hashem. I do a little bit of hishtados. I do what I think that I should and then I let Hashem do the rest and I've seen Baruch Hashem tremendous like Yeshua it's just like unbelievable 
there's one thing where I'm being tested in my bitachon now, and I'm ashamed to say that at night when I go to sleep, I only have one lock on my door, which I'm sure is not really necessary if you're a Baal Bitachon, but I'm afraid when I go to sleep at night for my children, I'm afraid of somebody coming into my home and not just somebody, I'm afraid of I, New York, Brooklyn is full of wonderful Arabs. Some of them are very nice, but I don't know them personally and I can't count on that. I'm just, I have a, like a natural fear as a mother. Um, and I, and I don't know if I should put another lock on my door or if that's a breach of Pitachon, of my Pitachon Shalema. Put another lock on the door. <laughs> I know that it's silly when I say, I try to wriggle out of this question. I, <laughs> I should put another. Yes. <laughs> Not because you're lacking in Amuna, but because that's what Hashem expects you to do. Okay, that's what I wanted to know. If you would have said no, I wouldn't have done it. The I biggest just... tzaddik with the greatest amount of Amuna is told in the Torah that he's not allowed to go in Amokim Sakona. Right. Amuna doesn't mean uh, be be irresponsible be reckless it doesn't mean that so right. if oh the, here's the real question <laughs> if, if you put a second lock on the door will you sleep well yes but i will feel like i'm lacking in bitachon and that will that might keep me up also <laughs> <laughs> why, don't, why don't you just leave the door open you can't win why don't You're you just right. leave the door open so uh, I no, think about Bitachon would lock one lock and say, this is enough. Hashem doesn't need me to lock other locks. I don't need to add locks. Instead of investing in pieces of metal, I should invest in my Bitachon because really, in reality, there is no lock. There is only Hashem. If somebody wanted to come in, if really, Hashem I really let them wanna, I really want to emphasize a question because really it's a big thing now in our communities. It's a lot of from people going to get guns and they're getting gun permits. I just want to like, you know, push your question to the next, not just getting a second lock. What's what, What's the rabbi's position on that as well? It's not a good idea for everyone to be carrying a gun. I'm not looking to get we a gun. Are not, we are not gun people. Even if you have a gun, it's like Jackie Mason says, if, you, if somebody threatens you, you'll point the gun at them and say, don't do that. It's not nice. <laughs> Let's negotiate a deal. No, we, we're, having a gun doesn't mean you can shoot people. <laughs> Shooting at a target is not the same as shooting at a person. You have to have a certain, a certain, uh, I don't know, thick skin to be able to shoot, even to shoot a squirrel is, 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 is shocking to the system. So those who could use a gun would benefit from having one. Those who can't use it anyway, what, you're just going to hurt yourself. So ha everybody should have a gun. Uh, it's scary. But pepper spray? Why not? If, if you have some way of discouraging a criminal, why wouldn't you do it? The, the real question is, again, like if you had the second lock on your door, would you then stop being afraid or it wouldn't help anyway? It would help, but I don't like that I'm relying on something that is so finite when I know that Hashem is protecting me. I know he is. You're not relying on a lock. You're doing what Hashem wants. A Baal Tachon does from one place to another. There is no difference. There's no one place that's dangerous, one place that's not dangerous. I'm safe here. I'm not safe here. Hashem is everything, everywhere, at all but, times. But there is such a thing as a mokim sakona, and you're not allowed to put yourself in a sakona. How do I decide if I'm in a mokim sakona? <laughs> well, you know, there are bad guys roaming the streets. It's a mokim sakona. I let my son go on an electric scooter, my 13-year-old, to yeshiva every day. That's a with, with pepper spray, but <laughs> he's a little kid. He doesn't have to... <laughs> pass the Batachan test fine. Yeah, I let him do that. I know that Shem is with him. I daven from all day. I say to him, yeah. I don't have any social media. I don't do anything. I just daven and I ask Hashem to protect my children and think about the stupid second lock at night. And that's it. So put the stupid lock on so okay. you can think about it. Okay. Thank you, Rabbi. Shabbat
just just for, before we go to closing, basically we want all the nations, everybody to start learning Torah. In other words, to you know, we should teach them something practical. Well, what are we looking? You know, what are we? What's the the ticket? Yes, we do want to teach the the world. But before you can teach them, they first have to be impressed with you and want to learn from you. So first we have to model what it means to be godly, what it means to be a a chosen people. And then when we have their respect, then we can start to educate them. And that's what you would introduce into the universities, start teaching Torah for curriculum. So I'm reminded of a funny story. You're not allowed to go in a Mokim Sakona. So uh, when the Rebbe Rashab, three generations ago, when he traveled in the winter, you had to check the ice. They were traveling in a sled with a horse. So you have to check because uh, thin ice is a Mokim Sakona. You're not allowed to go. So there was a Chosid who traveled with the Rebbe, and when they came to a frozen lake, he asked the Chosid to go out with a stick and test the ice to see if it's... uh... This Chosid was a a Letz. He had a good sense of humor. So he goes out and he taps on the ice with the stick and he comes back and he doesn't say anything. So finally the Rebbe says to him, Nu, can we go? He said, I can go, but I don't think you can go. So what does that mean? He said, <laughs> So I can go, but I'm not sure about you. So a tzaddik is not allowed to go in a mokim sakona. What is it, a lack of emunah? Not at all. It's a mitzvah like all other mitzvahs. Perfect. Let me hop around this question. Somebody said that I'm not from, and the past few weeks really shook me up to the core. I want to start becoming more from. Any recommendations where to start? Don't become from. Do not become from. Take on another mitzvah. Be mahader in the mitzvah you're doing. Don't become from. It's a foreign concept. Show me where in the Torah the word from appears. There's no word for it. There's no frum, there's no religious. There are mitzvahs. Do the Abrishta's mitzvahs for him. Don't become frum. It's, I was talking to some guy in Eretz Yisrael before this whole thing happened, who decided to learn and to teach and he started becoming a Shemr Shabbos, and he started, and I said to him, what, one more mitzvah, and you're going to become a Baal Tshuva. He says, Baal Tshuva? That's from the 60s. Today, Yiddishkeit is mainstream. You don't become a Baal Tshuva. See, becoming a Baal Tshuva means you have to leave the mainstream, go off to a yeshiva someplace, become estranged to your family until they think you're nuts, and become different. That was in the 60s. Today, don't go off away from the mainstream. You are the mainstream, and so is Yiddishkeit. Stay where you are and bring mitzvahs to where you are. Don't become frum as if only from people do mitzvahs. Jews do mitzvahs, from or not. Tzaddik or Benini or Rasha, Jews do mitzvahs. One more story to end it off. One of the protests on the university campus, they were very vicious, pro-Palestinian, and nobody, nobody was stopping them, nobody was arguing with them. And suddenly one of the professors, a Jewish professor, who was known to be an atheist, a very proud atheist, he got up and he just lost his cool. 
he started screaming. The police came and arrested him for his own protection. The next day he comes to class and a uh, student, a woman, comes over to him and hands him a bouquet of flowers. He says, what is this? She said, I was so proud of you yesterday when you stood up and you said what you, defending the Jewish people. And I was so proud of you, I just had to buy you these flowers. So he said, you're Jewish? She said, no. He said, then why are you so proud? She says, because it's amazing to see the chosen people acting like the chosen people. He said, you know, I don't believe that. I don't believe in the chosen people. I don't believe in the Bible. I don't believe in God. She said, well, whether you believe it or not, we know it's true. Before we go to closing, there's one more million dollar question that somebody wants to ask, and then we're going to go to the closing part, okay? Yeah. You ready for the million dollar question? Okay, you're on. Hi, thank you so much for your class and, you know, everything I really been enjoying. Um, I just wanted to know, like, I don't know if you could answer it, but um, I want to know, like, what we could do differently to bring Mashiach after all these years of all the great people and our Avos and everyone, he still didn't come, but I want to know, like, is it just our small acts of kindness that's going to bring him? Or is there a message that we're not reading? Like, how can we bring him that he's so close? <laughs> yes, just a few more small mitzvahs. All the heavy lifting our ancestors already took care of. Now we just have to make mitzvahs mainstream. No mesidus nefesh, no heroics, no, you know, no uh, earth shattering. Just a little more down to earth. A Jew puts on tefillin. A Jew lights candles. A Jew fasts on Yom Kippur. A Jew dances Simchas Torah. Nothing, nothing, again, nothing heroic. Just factual. Factual. When the world sees us, and now they can see us because everything is public, when the world sees that we are still loyal to the original word of God, they are going to fall on their faces and want to learn from us. I was in an Uber like two weeks ago, and uh, we're driving through the streets of Crown Heights, and uh, there are sukkahs all over the place. So the uh, Uber driver from Trinidad says, what are those shacks everywhere? I said, we're celebrating a holiday this time of the year. He says, oh, you do this every year? I said, yes, for the last 3,334 years. He was blown away. By what? By a simple fact. So let's go public with our Yiddishkeit, not with our army. The army knows what to do, and they'll do it. But we got to go public with our Yiddishkeit. We're the only ones who know what morality is. Never mind, be moral. We're the only ones. It's true. It's a fact. They know that they're confused. And if they didn't know it until now, in the last two weeks, they know it. I'm not talking about the ones who are beyond help. So I suggested to one of these uh, counter uh, protesters, I said, don't carry a sign saying, Demonstration, we're demonstrating for peace. Don't demonstrate for peace. Demonstrate peace. Show what things are when they're normal and when they're correct. Be a role model of peace. Don't demonstrate for peace. Don't demonstrate for Judaism. 
demonstrate Judaism more hey, than before. Let's go to closing, Rabbi Friedman. First of all, great for coming on tonight, Rabbi Friedman, and the, all the thousands of people that were here tonight. Everybody got chizik. People were texting. It was an unbelievable class tonight. I met some all the tens of thousands that would listen to it. Rabbi Friedman, you always come in the clutch. You always come in the, you know, <laughs> in the time. So thank you so much for coming, spending the late night with us. And again, for anybody who's here the first time, every Sunday night at 9.30 on this Zoom ID, we have different topics, the Frabonim, the following Sunday. I know this is a special edition Monday night. I know tonight's Monday night. But uh, we're going to have Hashem, a, a deep share in the Beis Levi with Rabbi David Sutton. He's the author of the Beis Levi in English, the Blue Book from Art Scroll. It's called Master, Mastering Tranquility Insights from the Teaching of Yosef Dov Salvechik, Rosh of Volozhin, Exploring the Tachan Through the Wisdom of the Beis Levi's Teaching. It's going to be very powerful. Let people, you know, really learn, you know, the Beis Levi's Sefer. We're going to try to go through it together. So it should be a really uh, deep, deep share. And again, everything is recorded tonight. Hashem will be on AchamBurnfield.com. If anybody has any questions, you can email Coach Menachem at gmail.com. Mr. Hashem will send it to Rabbi Manas' team. It will upload it to the rabbi's uh, YouTube site with hundreds of thousands of followers. Tonight's share is 162. If anybody wants to listen on the phone, Mr. Hashem, uh, it's 848-777-GROW. It's 848-777-GROW. Yes, somebody texted me. It's every Sunday night at 930 Eastern Standard Time is the share here. Yes. And again, a thank you to all the advertising sponsors of Lakewood Scoop, Elliot and Ariel from Five Town Central, Haile Kauf from JCN. And I'm going to give a closing Menachem and the Rabbi Friedman. Just leave the oil with the very chizik right before you leave. So Mr. Rabbi Friedman, it was such clarity tonight. It was We covered so much. And, and like somebody, even the last lady, like she didn't want to ask her a question. Every question is a valuable question. If you have something that bothers you, something on your mind, it's not just you. A lot of people feel like the way she feels. People feel, you know, these type of thoughts. And we come here together to really speak it out and get a hadracha and try to get some chizik and try to grow together. And um, it's an open platform. It's a platform people could say what they feel. And, you know, it's not uh, pre-recorded or edited. It's just raw. And it's what it is. And Robert Friedman, you're, you're amazing. You're deep. And uh, what you're saying is 100% true. I mean, just really to recap, I mean, we are what we are. The, these stupid arguments that we're doing, trying to be diplomatic and trying to be uh, the humanitarian, it's all stupidity. We have to be uh, Am and Ifhar. We're supposed to be the Yiddish people. We're Jewish people. This is our nation. This is our land. This is who we are. We represent God. They say that a, a yid is a tzalam al kim. He's a piece of Hashem. The, the anti-Semitism is because they hate God. So they see a yid is an automatic hatred because a yid is represents the Ebrishda. So we have to for care, be more more out there. We have to be more who we are. This is what we are. They're not embarrassed waving the Palestinian flag. They're not embarrassed walking around and saying crazy things. Why should we be embarrassed to put an Israeli flag by our house or to put it on our car? Why Why do we have that fear that we're going to get hurt? We're gonna get, it's it's a very disturbing concept. They 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 have more azas. They have more, and that that's what I think bothers us. We're more a, a nation of rahmanis and softness and peace, and that's what always gets us exploited all these years over and over and over again. And the arguments are all stupid. The Rabbi Freeman, like you said, they're all dumb arguments. It's a waste of time. It's all a waste of time. And um, Israel has to do what they need to do, and we need to do what we need to do. And uh, we have to remember at the end of the day, Hashem runs the world, and Hashem is in charge. Rabbi Friedman, the word they say, it's another word. They said, you know, there was a plane crash that happened and everybody died on the plane crash. 400 people. They said, how did the tragedy happen? He said, you have to understand for these 400 people to die or the people that died in this, Hashem had to have a cheshman for every single person and every single neshama, why they had to die in this plane and why they, their, their, their family had to suffer. There's a million cheshbonists that go into every single thing that happened that we don't understand. So it's not the miracle that, you know, that, oh, the miracle is that even the people that this is what happened to, there was a cheshman. Again, we don't understand that we're here. We have to accept that. But there's a cheshman for every single thing. We, we 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 don't see the big picture. We don't know the big picture. But um, we have to trust in the same way. Like you said, they could have went in. There's, there's stories that are coming out. Some say it's true. Some say it's not true. There's crazy stories that are coming out. They didn't go into certain... There's a story that somebody sent me from a rov that was from Ashkelon. He said that they were about to go into to, 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 to Ashkelon, to one of the cities. It was actually marked on their maps. And they said, why didn't they go into the city? And uh, this rov from Stay Roots, uh, this rov from Ashkelon said that when the terrorists came there, there was three rabbis. Rabbi Friedman, you heard this, this story that came out today? Yeah, with flaming swords. There was three rabbis standing there, and they showed him pictures, and they pointed. It was the Baba Sali, it was the rov, but three, three of them were standing in front of that, 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 that settlement, and they didn't let them in. And it's mind-boggling. And also, like you said, that there was no army there. They could have continued. They could have went further. Forget They retreated. So we have to do understand there is a shimer and there is a reason why these people and why this happened. We're not here. We're not privileged to that information. And like Robert Friedman said, we don't want to know that information. It's not. It's not our. It's not our thing. But we have to know that this Chaz Ben Hashem protects us. And just like when certain all the years things didn't happen, nobody said anything. We had thousands and thousands of missiles, and almost nothing happened. That's not a miracle. 
one missile goes into any place. It's, you know, so we have all the chashboinists because because of this, because of that. But anyway, Rabbi Friedman, thank you for everything. I hope everybody got a lot of chizagata tonight. Me and Menachem worked very hard to, to do two nights in a row. I'm planning on sleeping the whole day tomorrow. But um, thank you again, Rabbi Friedman, for coming on. Coach Menachem closing, and Rabbi Friedman, we need the very chizik before you leave. But yes, as usual, Rabbi Friedman, after hearing um, especially two hours, I know there are many people that the con their concepts that have been gr grown up for many years with those concepts and they have to switch it. Yeah. And certain different certain ideas they picked up and they're like, what's Robert Friedman saying? How could he say that? And they have to think twice, wait a second, let's understand it. Yeah. And uh here we are, yeah, to be Mechazak ourselves, the moon of the to see where we are to become stronger. And this is this is what Hashem wants from us. And uh Thank you very much. And uh, next week we will continue with the Moon of Betachen. Good, good. Which we're trying. Thank you. So the final point is we have to tell the world stop using the Ebrishter for what you need and start serving the Ebrishter for what he needs. If we stop being selfish, even when we're being frum, even when we're being spiritual, and it's all selfish about me, that's not a good world. Moshiach will change that thinking and we will start serving Hashem, not asking him to serve us. And that's for everybody, everybody in the world. So we should look forward to that time when the entire world will say, tell us what Hashem wants and we'll do it without asking for a reward. Thank you very much for this opportunity and uh, look forward to incredibly good news because it's coming. Amen. Oh, Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful night. It's time to go to sleep. Take care. Yeah. Good night.